So, talking about uh, the transit of, uh, um, of a planet, so if you wonder what the transit is all about, the transit is basically a sort of eclipse, uh, if you like. So you know that uh, um, an eclipse is when, uh, for example, the, the moon is between Earth and the sun and they use start seeing the sun covered basically by the moon. Something very similar happens here. Now, because um, of the distance between the, the planet, like Mercury in this case, and the Earth, Mercury obviously is, is quite small and is quite far away from us, and so it will never cover completely the sun as the moon, for example, uh, is able to do. So here, for example, here you see uh, this was the transit of Mercury in 1973, and this is the transit of Venus, of Venus sorry, that happened in 2004. So usually the transit happens only uh, with the innermost planets that are Mercury and uh, Venus. So as you know, there is the Sun, there is Mercury, Venus, Earth, and then there is the asteroid belt, and then we have Jupiter, Saturn, and so on and so forth. So, now, here just to give you an idea when it happens, um, this is the basically a list of the transits and when it happens uh, from 1901 until 2050. So this is the transit, uh, where are we today? 2016, May um, the 9th, and this is the universal time, okay, which is not necessarily our own time. Uh, the next one will be in 2019, 11th of November, then 2032, 39 and 49. So usually um, the transit of Mercury happens about 13 times per century. Now if you look at the transit of Venus, it's very rare. So unfortunately, um, here at least here at Mercury, we missed it and we have to wait uh, until probably our grandchildren, uh, or even maybe great grandchildren will be here because uh, um, Venus transits in front of the, of the Sun, between the Sun and the Earth, only twice in a century. So it was 2004 and 2012. So the next one is 2117. So I don't think we'll be here to, um, to witness it, but you know, maybe our genes will be here through our grandchildren, maybe great-grandchildren. So it's quite, it's quite a rare event, but Mercury, luckily, is less rare. Um, so this is how a transit uh, looks like. So that's basically what we are experiencing today. So Mercury will start uh, coming here. It takes about seven hours for the full transit to happen. So we should more or less be somewhere here at the moment. And then in a few hours, uh, Mercury will uh, basically be out of the sun. Well, it will be out of the, of the space between the Sun and, um, and the Earth. So, again, just to give you a bit of the history of the transit. Now, um, people started realizing that they could understand when the transit was happening back in the 17th century. The first one was Johannes Kepler, which is quite famous for, for his uh, three um, laws. And uh, it was the first one who basically um, predicted in a very detailed, detailed sorry, and precise way the future position of the planet. And he published that um, in a sort of twilight chart. And uh, he realized that the first transit that could be seen was Mercury, and uh, it was in 1631. Now, Kepler died, unfortunately, before witnessing that, but uh, a French astronomer, um, Gassendi, um, he observed, uh, he was the first one to observe the transit of Mercury. And uh, then uh, the next transit was 80 years after that, in 1639, and these are two amateurs, uh, um, uh, astronomers, Horrocks and Crabtree, and uh, again, uh, they um, observe uh, uh, the, the transit of Mercury after eight years. So, as you can see, people started realizing that they could predict uh, this transit. And uh, what happened, uh, in particular, uh, this was a sort of Halley, who started this type of, uh, if you like, trend. Um, Halley, which is famous for the comet, the comet of Halley, this is the same Halley, 
1677, so this is his uh, dissertation on uh, um, basically how to measure the distance between the Sun and the Earth. So he was the first one who realized that using the transit of a planet, for example Mercury, he could uh, um, basically measure the distance between the Sun and the Earth. And that's what he did. And these are the type of calculations that he made. And the, the value that he got was quite a good one. And uh, what Halley basically started, um, he started a, a sort of, if you like, uh, hunting of the transit. So he was pushing people to um, see the transit wherever it was happening in the world. So there were a lot of expeditions of people uh, traveling literally around the world uh, to follow the transit. Now the problem was that sometimes they couldn't, you know, get there in time, or sometimes uh, it was cloudy or whatever, so it wasn't really easy. The other problem was that sometimes uh, the transit was predicted somewhere, but it was not happening there. It was happening slightly somewhere else. But anyway, people were quite uh, um, happy with this sort of hunting of the transit, and there were a lot of expeditions um, during the 17th and also 18th century. So, now, the transit was also used uh, once by um, Lomonosov, a Russian uh, astronomer in 1761, to basically um, detect, if you like, the atmosphere of Venus. So he was the first one to say Venus has got an atmosphere. So how did he do that? Again, this is the calculation that, uh, and the observation that he made. And uh, what he saw, um, while observing the transit, he saw a sort of what is called now a um, Lomonosov arc, which is a sort of a, a bulge of light which when Venus was coming out from the sun, so when it was at the edge of the sun, he could see a bulge of light surrounding Venus. So he thought that that one was uh, the sign, if you like, of the atmosphere of Venus. Now, in 2004, a um, couple of astronomers uh, said, they said, no, it, was, it is not the um, atmosphere of Venus. Uh, we uh, have done uh, our own calculations and uh, the monosoph was uh, not right. Now, in order to understand if this is true or not, what they did, they, uh, in 2012, they made again the same calculations using our own technology uh, to check if uh, they could see again the Lomonosov arc, and they could. So again, again, using our own technology, they could see what Lomonosov in 1761 basically observed, which was uh, obviously confirmation of, of uh, um, you know, the, the, the reality, the, the fact that what Lomonosov saw was genuine. So this is the first uh, uh, picture ever of the transit of Venus. It was taken in 1882, and here you see Venus, and this is the first picture that was ever taken of the transit, which is quite a clear and nice, uh, a nice picture. So, as I said, this is how the transit of Venus in, 20, in 2012 basically um, uh, was seen. So, as you see, the Venus was just slowly, slowly making um, its way through the sun. Now, as I said, uh, unfortunately we missed it, uh, particularly because uh, um, physics was not as mass at the time. <laughs> we came in 2013, if it would have been 2013, we would have uh, enjoyed the, uh, the show. Unfortunately, we couldn't. And the next one, I'm afraid, uh, we're probably um, you know, to wait a very long time and we will not see it because it is 11th of December, um, 2117. So this is just to give an idea a bit of, uh, you know, the transit and how people use the transit and how people start realizing uh, that they could enjoy the spectacle a uh, long time ago. So I finish it here. I think, uh, is it you, Ali, the next one? Thank you very much for everybody coming. Um, hopefully you're all able to see this. This image is a live feed from the Royal Institute of Big Red. Were you all able to see something? The, the spot that you saw was tiny, not because Mercury is tiny, 
Mercury is the closest planet to the sun, so unfortunately, the Mer um, Venus one, you can, see if, if, if you were alive when it was around, was, was quite a lot bigger. What I want to talk today about is what can we learn from transits. Okay, so it's nice to have a look at a spot traveling across the sun, but what can we learn from transits? And in particular, not just what can we learn from the planets in our solar system, because it's a better explanation, it's bulge and Venus, the two major attacks of it. But also, what can we learn if we study planets in other solar systems? So one of the things that's very exciting about studying planets in astronomy these days is that we know that there are many other solar systems out there, okay? with a series of, with a star and a series of planets around it that look quite similar to our own. And this obviously then raises the next possibility, is there life in other solar systems as well? Okay, so we're very interested to study planets and solar systems that are very similar in composition and size to our own. So, the first thing that we can say about transits is they can provide us a lot of information okay, about uh, the other planets as they pass in front of stars or even other planets. So transits of other planets like Jupiter or Saturn are also very interesting as well as um, planets that move in front of, for instance, our Sun. And whilst we can visit nearby planets in our solar system, so we've sent probes to Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus, and now very recently Pluto, um, we can't easily do that for more distant worlds. Okay? So what would be nice is if we can indirectly get some information about these planets by looking at the information we can get, for instance, from these transits. So what we're interested to do is look at the light that we get. Okay, so can anyone tell me what that is? Anyone tell me what's going on there? Yeah? That's light going through a, a prism, yeah? And it gets split into the colours of the rainbow. And what this means is, is that by investigating what happens to the light that's produced okay, from the white light that we see, we can actually tell something about what the light has travelled through. Okay. This is a very simple experiment. You shine white light through a prism and you get the rainbow, basically. But actually, if you look at the light that you get from a star, it should be a continuous rainbow. Yeah. It should be everything from the red, the orange, the yellow, the green, the blue, the violet, etc. But actually, what you see from a star is this. You see that there are lines missing. Okay? And those lines that are missing are due to atoms, for instance, inside the star, absorbing certain amounts of energy. And those energies correspond to certain colours. Okay? And it's these lines that tell us what the star is made of. We can't go to the sun for two reasons. One, it's quite far away. And two, it's very, very hot. If we get very close to the sun, we're going to burn up. But instead, what we can do is we can look at the light from this star, the sun, and see what it's made of by looking at what all these lines are doing. And the more lines that are missing, the more elements they tell us are, uh, are, are present there. So, for instance, anyone ever heard of the gas hydrogen and helium? Those gases correspond to certain lines, and those lines that you see in this rainbow are removed. So what happens if you investigate the light that you see from exoplanets or other things as they move across a star? If you see more lines removed, that tells you that that particular planet contains those elements. Okay? So this is what happens if you investigate what happens to the uh, light as it travels to the Earth's atmosphere. You see certain lines in the ultraviolet removed, you see certain lines in the red removed, etc. They correspond to hydrogen, helium, water, carbon dioxide, all the things you see in the atmosphere. So by studying these lines, what we can do is we can try and understand what exactly is going on in the atmosphere of any of these planets. This can tell us a lot of things. It can tell us what's the atmosphere made of. Okay, so just by looking at the light from a distant planet or star, you can tell what the planet or star is made of. Now that's pretty cool. Okay? If I actually want to know what this atmosphere here is made of, it took us hundreds of years to figure that out. Now we can just look at the logs from something else. So, for instance, you can see that the Earth has water in it, it's got oxygen in it, and it's got carbon dioxide in it. Okay? Mars mostly appears just to have carbon dioxide, and we can get that from the light. You can also get an idea of the temperature of the star. Okay? So these are the, 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 the spectra that you get from Jupiter and Saturn, and you can figure out that Jupiter and Saturn are much hotter than our planet by looking at the colours of the light that's removed. Okay. So basically, as you see here, you have your star, you have your planet moving in front of it, and you examine the spectra of the light that you get out of it. 
And it's from that that you can tell what's the star made of, whether it's got water vapour on it, what's the concentration of hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, etc. Now, if there's intelligent life on a planet, it's probably going to need oxygen. If there's plant life on a planet, it's probably going to need water and carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and all of these things. So by examining these concentrations, you can figure out which one of these planets is at least habitable. And you get that all from, for instance, a planet moving in front of a star, like so. Which I think is pretty cool. So as I can say, you can talk about the presence of water, oxygen, dust. So if you predict silicon, you can see whether the, the planet is made of a, a hard rocky surface or a dry dusty surface. Whether the sky is blue, you can figure out what, if you were standing on the planet, whether the sky on that planet would be blue or not, okay? due to the scattering of the light it moves with and the average temperature. I like to keep things short and simple, so that's what I've got to say. But hopefully you learn something new then. But just by examining the light that you get from a star as a planet transits it, you can learn an awful lot about that planet. Okay, thank you very much. Next I'd like to introduce Mittel. He's our, one of our third year students in the Applied Physics team. So Mittel is going to be speaking about planet Mercury and talking about some of the history and some of the facts about Mercury itself. Okay. Thank you. Right, so I'm going to start with a little bit about history about Mercury. So the observation of Mercury goes back all the way to the 14th century BC. And at the time, people only knew about five planets, and they called these planets as wandering stars for obvious reasons. And the planet Mercury was named after the Roman, Roman god of Mercy, and in Latin it's called Mer Mercari, meaning to trade. And it's actually easy, easy to spot Mercury in the dark sky. So in the morning time, it's just above the horizon in the, in the east direction. And during the sunset, it's actually in the west direction in roughly the same coordinates, as you can see in the figure there. And back in, uh, back in the 14th century, uh, people called morning stars as Apollo and the, the, sun, the sunset stars as Hermes, which is the name of the god. So a little bit, little facts about uh, planet Mercury. Um, so we all know that Mercury is closest to the sun and it's the first planet. And it's the smallest planet in the solar system. And a single day on Mercury is about 59 Earth days. And the year lasts about 80, 80 Earth days. And because it's closest to the sun, the temperature on Mercury can vary quite a lot. And this has to do with the orbit of Mercury as well, which I'll get back to in a minute. So the temperature on Mercury can vary from minus 173 degrees Celsius to about 427 degrees Celsius. So the closest approach to Mercury is called perihelion, and the furthest approach is the aphelion. And this has significance on the weather that we get on Mercury. And we also know that the rotation of Earth's axis is not vertical is slightly tilted by about 20, 24 degrees and when compared to the Mercury, the axis of rotation is actually uh, perpendicular and this leads to, and so the axis of tilt leads to different weathers and different seasons that we get on Earth but on Mercury, because the axis is almost vertical, there are no seasons So because Mercury is closest to the sun, uh, the sunlight on Mercury is about 6.5 times more than what we get here on Earth. And also 2.5 times, the, uh, the size of the sun is about 2.5 times greater than what we have here on, on Earth. And in the figure here, we can see what the sun looks like from all different planets. So on Mercury, we see that it's, it's way, way, way greater as compared to Earth. So a little bit about the um, geology of, um, of planet Mercury. So you see the, the, uh, um, the iron core in Mercury makes about 85% of Mercury's radius compared to the Earth, which is only about 32%. And the size of Mercury is, is relatively very small, again, compared to the Earth. And the intense sunlight uh, on Mercury because of its distance from the sun 
um, eroding the surface temperature and also the collision from uh, materials that is coming from outer space. So Mercury almost has no atmosphere and so one of the things that people think is that Mercury is the hottest planet because it's the first planet to the sun, but it's actually Venus. And the reason for this is because Mercury has almost no atmosphere at all. Well, compared to Venus, it has at atmosphere, and so it traps in a lot of radiation that's coming from the sun. So most of the atmosphere um, of Mercury is made up of hydrogen, helium, and a lot of heavy elements. And this has been constantly blown away in space due to the solar wind from the sun. And this is shown in the figure here. So this is Mercury, and there's a sun on this direction here. And there's a solar wind coming from the sun, which blows away um, the atmosphere of Mercury. So you get these trails, just like uh, if, you have, if you have a comet passing by the sun, you get a trail. <coughs> So again, going back to what I said earlier, that Mercury has no atmosphere at all. Um, if you look at the pattern structures on Mercury and compare it to the Moon, they actually have similar patterns. So these are due to the collision between the um, surface of Mercury and the meteorites coming from outer space. And just by looking at the size and shape of these craters, scientists can figure out how, what was the speed of the impact and the impact force as well. So this is one of the interesting features of Mercury. Uh, so this was formed during the formation of the solar system. And it's a meteorite colliding the surface of Mercury. And it's believed to be one of the largest impact sites in the solar system. And one of the largest um, impact structure on Mercury. So there are two of them. This is one of them. And this was discovered by NASA in 1974. So in impact as such, actually leads to pressure waves um, in, the, in the iron core of Mercury and this then leads to something called topography uh, as you can see in the figure here so up impact from this direction here changes the structure that we get on this direction and this is all due to the pressure waves so about 20 years ago um, a radar from Earth um, spotted water ice on Mercury and this wasn't confirmed until 2012 when NASA sent a spacecraft to uh, in an orbit around Mercury. So in this figure we have a crater on, at the north, at Mercury's north and south pole. So this is the north pole and this is the same image as that but by increasing the brightness and contrast you can see a bit more detail with that. So most of the water ice on Mercury is deposited in craters. And this is actually the superimposed image of the satellite and uh, the radar. So one of the first tests of Einstein's theory of relativity was Mercury's orbit. So we have Newton's laws of mechanics which describes um, uh, the orbital planets precisely, but in the case of Mercury, it actually failed. So, well, it gave a right value, but not, not exact value. And so, a new theory of gravity was needed in order to understand the orbit of Mercury, and this was um, given by Einstein's theory of general relativity. So, in Einstein's theory, space can actually bend and twist. So, if you have a mass and if you place it, so if you imagine the space, as a rubber sheet, and if you place a massive object in the middle, it can bend the space, uh, it can bend the rubber sheet. And the object is actually trying to follow a straight line, but because of the curvature, it can roll around, around, the, around the object. And that is gravity. <coughs> so this is a little animation showing the space time, and there's a, there's a sun in the middle, which is causing this curvature. And here we have some planet which is going around in orbit. Um, thank you very much. Hello everybody. Um, my name is Owen. I'm a physics technician here in the Applied Physics course. And I'm going to be finishing off the lectures just by talking a little bit about, about our sun. 
Um, so we're here today really because we can see the interaction between Mercury and the Sun and how Mercury's passing in front of it. But I want to speak a little bit about our Sun itself and maybe some of the structures that you might have seen on the Sun today. Okay, so first of all, just a quick introduction to our Sun. Uh, it's our closest star. So I suppose when you look up the night sky, you see all the stars scattered uh, across the sky. And we kind of forget sometimes that our Sun is part of this solar array. So you have many, many millions of stars up in the night sky, and our sun is a relatively un insignificant uh, one of those. So it wouldn't be too big or it wouldn't be too small. It's just a, a normal average size star floating in the, in the galaxy. Okay? Now our star would have formed around 3.6 billion years old. Okay? And why I suppose our star is so important to us, or our sun is so important to us, is that it's a massive source of energy. Okay, so you see you stand outside, you feel the heat of the sun beating down you, and that sun's energy really feeds our planet with the energy. So without our sun being that distance, the perfect distance away from us, we wouldn't have any life on Earth. Okay, so I'm just going to talk very briefly on how maybe that sun creates this energy. Okay, so what we have in the core of the sun here, this very, very warm area here in the middle of the sun, is called the sun's core. And this is where nuclear fusion takes place. Okay, so we might have heard of nuclear fission before, which we have uh, creating a nuclear power plant. But nuclear fusion is a similar type of nuclear energy where we bind atoms together. So you have huge pressures and huge temperatures pushing hydrogen and helium atoms together to cause massive amounts of energy. And that happens in the core of our sun. Now, with this energy, you get a huge amount of heat being formed. And this heat can transfer it into light energy. So that's why we can see our sun is so very bright, is because of the nuclear fusion that's going on in its core. As you move out from the core of the sun here, so into the second region, we call it the radiative zone. Okay? And in this zone, the heat from the core is transferred outwards. Okay? So it's like radiation, like standing beside a radiator, you have the heat blasting out against you. Okay? And then as you move further out, the temperature of the sun begins to cool that little bit more. And we come into what's known here as our uh, convective zone. Okay? And in the convective zone, what you have is similar to maybe uh, if you were to boil a kettle. You have the hot um, liquid or the hot fluid coming up from the bottom. It's less dense, so it's rising to the top of the sun. And then when it comes to the top, it cools down and starts to come back down again. So that's your convection currents within, within the sun itself. And these convection currents are quite important because you might have seen some similar structures or some structures on the sun today that were dark. So did anybody see any dark structures in the sun? Hands up. Yeah, a couple of the guys. You saw a couple of dark structures pretty much similar size to Mercury. Or they appeared to be similar size to Mercury. Okay? And these dark spots are quite important. These are known as sunspots. So these sunspots here. And we call sunspots relatively cold areas on the sun. And by cold, I mean they're around 2,000 to 3,000 degrees Celsius. So that's not really cold at all, right? But it's cold compared to the rest of the sun. Okay, so the rest of the outside of the sun is around 5,000 degrees Celsius. But that's also cold compared to the core of the sun. Anybody have a guess at what the temperature of the core of the sun is? 10,000, we'll have to go higher. They're getting closer. Higher again. Nine million. It's 15 million degrees Celsius. Okay, so 15 million degrees Celsius in the core of the sun. And as you go further out, it gets a little bit colder. Okay? Now, as I was saying before, these convection currents are the motion of the heat coming out from the sun, and it cools down and comes back down again, causes these sunspots. Okay? Now, the reason it causes these sunspots is because of magnetic fields within the sun. Okay, so here's a couple of examples of the sunspots you would have seen. Okay, now, what you have to bear in mind is the sun is huge, and each one of these sunspots is around the size of the Earth. Okay, so each sunspot is about the size of planet Earth. Okay, so they're massive structures. Okay, so Earth would be dwarfed in one of these. Okay, and the sunspots are created again from this convection. So the heat rising from the inside of the sun, it's cooling and coming down. And then what also is, is, is helping the sunspots 
are magnetic fields. So you might have heard on Earth, or if you use a compass, you'd be able to find where North is, because Earth has a magnetic field around it. And it's very similar to the Sun. Okay, but the Sun's magnetic field is a lot different, because it's made up of plasma. And this plasma is moving as the Sun is rotating around itself. Okay, so it creates this magnetic field, and these sunspots are formed because of the magnetic field. So, with certain directions of the field, these sunspots, or the magnetic field, stops convection. Okay, so remember I spoke about convection of the heat rising up? These magnetic fields in this area stop that convection. So you end up getting a cold area, or a relatively cold area, around uh, the concentrated magnetic fields. Okay? And then that's why they appear black. Now, in reality, these sunspots would probably be as bright as the moon in the night sky. So if you look up at the moon, you see the moon is nice and white. Okay? So that's the colour that these sunspots really are. But then compared to how bright the actual sun is, they appear dark. Okay? So this cold area uh, within the sun. Also here, now I won't go into them too much, but different structures in the sun here, which you might be able to see uh, later on in the telescope, these granules. So these are kind of boiling... Uh, motions of plasma on the, on, on the outer layer of the sun. Okay? So these kind of, um, just, uh, the sun's always in, in motion, it's not, a, it's not a solid surface. Okay? So, moving on, what I find very interesting about the sun are these structures here. Okay? You have your prominence and your flares. And something else we have is called coronal mass ejection. And what happens is you have all the different particles of the sun, or all the different um, bits of plasma, they get caught up in this magnetic field, and they get thrown out of the sun. So you have these loops happening out at the edge of the sun. So here's a, an image taken from the satellite. Okay, so these are, you can see here, they're similar to bar magnet, magnetic fields. They come out of the sun, and they drag all this hot plasma up with them. And these things can be massive. So here is planet Earth just to give you an example of how big these can be. Okay, so these can sit on the outside of the sun and they have these magnetic loops occurring. Now, these are relatively, I suppose, relatively safe to us for the most part, unless they start getting twisted. And once they start twisting, what can happen is you can have these explosions or these flares being created on the edge of the sun. So here you can see, this is taken from um, uh, the Solar Observatory satellite. Um, and you can see here the outside corona of, of the sun, and you have these explosions or these, these flares being created. And these are called coronal mass ejections. Okay, so the corona is the outside of the sun, and coronal mass ejections, you're really you're exploding different bits of particles into the, uh, into the surrounding space around the sun. Now, these can be very interesting, especially for us here on Earth, because what happens is, if we have a sunspot directly lined up on planet Earth, and it's a big enough sunspot, and you have these prominences, and if it gets twisted, and you have a coronal mass ejection, we can have millions of tons of solar material fired at our planet. Okay? And this can have a serious effect, really, on, on the planet itself. Okay? One real, I suppose, benign effect, or one normal, everyday effect, what you might see of, of solar wind, is the aurora borealis. Have you heard of this? Yeah, so the northern lights up in the sky. So what you have is you have these, the solar wind coming to Earth, it's interacting with our magnetic, our magnetic sphere, the sphere and our ionosphere, and it's creating these lights on the Earth. Now, a similar case happens here with your coronal mass ejections, okay, but it's much, much more intense. And what can happen is, if we're not careful, if we don't know they're coming, they can wipe out our electricity grid. Okay, so they can create such damage and devastation, they can create um, blackouts. So it was back in the early 90s, up in Toronto and in Quebec, that a coronal mass ejection occurred and it wiped out the electricity grid for a number of days. Right? So they were in complete blackout. Right? Um, and these are all due to your, um, your sunspots and solar activity. Okay? Now, just a quick run through really on this solar activity. Our sun is, it goes through what's called a, a solar cycle, or an 11 year cycle. And what you have is areas of very high solar activity compared against areas of very low solar activity. Okay? So at the areas of high solar activity, you have a large amount of sunspots happening. 
And it's during these times that we can start getting a little bit worried about coronal mass ejections coming to Earth. Now, these cycles happen every 11 years. And what's happening is the sun's magnetic field is flipping on its head. And as it flips on its head, as the poles are coming towards the equator of the sun or the middle of the sun, that's when we get the most amount of sunspots occurring. Okay? And then it flips over on the opposite side, so it's maybe facing downwards, and then it takes another 11 years to flip back up. So the sun goes through this cycle of high and low solar activity. Okay? And it's during these high areas of solar activity where we can have um, a lot of solar wind coming in our, our direction. Is that okay? Yeah. It's not too complicated, is it? Okay, so here's just an example of how our magnetic field helps to protect us from these solar winds. Okay, so our magnetic field surrounds planet Earth and it's continuously being bombarded with this solar wind. And these solar winds are made up of electrons and protons and different types of um, radiation. Okay, so the magnetic field can deflect most of this radiation and it's at these poles here, so you can see the north and the south pole, where our magnetic field is most vulnerable. So you can have the solar winds travelling down the north and the south pole, and that's why we get the aurora borealis, or the northern lights, in the sky at those areas. But during times of high solar activity, sometimes you might actually get the uh, northern lights down as far as London. You might be able to see them in the skies on, on very dark nights. Okay, so if you, if you look up during times, very, very high solar activity, you should be able to see some of the, uh, some of the northern lights. And here's just some newspaper clippings from throughout the years of people having sort of various different uh, negative effects, really, of solar weather. Okay, it, was, it was especially prominent during the, the early days of um, telegrams. So when the telegram poles were running the length of the country, they found that at certain times of the year, at certain uh, intervals, that you were getting serious disruption. And some of the telegram poles were, were breaking down because of this solar activity. So you had all these electrical charges coming in from space, connecting with the wires, and creating this huge electrical charge on the wires. Okay? And this has happened throughout history. So now, to create our satellites, to create our electricity stations, and any power generating plants, you have to take into account um, a lot of the, the solar energy and the solar uh, the, the effects of these, uh, these solar prominences and solar mass ejections. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Now, um, I'll just finish here now and just give you a quick, brief introduction on, on what kind of star we have in our sun. Um, now, I assume some of you might have heard of black holes and supernovae. Have you heard of those? Yeah, so these are black holes an area of very, very high gravity. So it's gravity gone wild and it sucks everything in around it. So it can suck up stars and planets in around it. And I suppose there would be an awful worry for us here on Earth. But we don't really have to be too worried about black holes and supernova um, up in the, uh, in, our, in, our, in, our, I suppose, in our local, in our local system here in, in, in the Milky Way. And the reason is, is because we can look up at the night sky and we can determine what type of stars we have around us. And then what kind of lifestyle or what kind of life plan that star will have. Okay? So we're down here in our sun-like star at the moment. Now as I mentioned before, our star, we'll say for argument's sake, is around 4 billion years old. So that would be halfway through its lifetime. Okay? So we'd have another good 4 billion years left in our star before it starts to I suppose, die, you could say. And when our star dies, what happens is it becomes a red giant. How, how it does that is in the middle of our star, as I said at the start, you have nuclear fusion going on. And that's pushing the star out. And then what's pulling the star in is a huge amount of gravity. Okay? But when a star becomes, like our star, comes to nearing the end of its life, that nuclear fusion gets much, much stronger than the gravity pulling it in. So our star starts to grow outwards. Okay? And our star will become what's known as a, a red giant. And it'll continue to do this, it'll continue to grow outwards and outwards until it uses up all of its energy. And then what it'll turn into are these lovely structures called the planetary nebula. So sometimes in the night sky, if you have a good enough telescope, you can see some of these nebula. And what they are, they're remnants of old stars. So it's an old star, when it's burnt out, it ejects all its gases into the local area around it, and you have these uh, lovely structures. And these, um, 
these Planck nebula are made up of a very different amount of elements. Okay, so as I was saying, you're fusing hydrogen at start, and they create newer and newer elements. So if you look around us here, we're full. The, the room is full of different types of elements, from your silicate into the wall to us main, mainly of carbon. And where those elements came from were from all different types of dying stars. Okay? The heavier elements would have come from supernovae explosion. So these would be very, very big stars exploding and producing much, much heavier elements, um, like a lot of the metals, the heavy metals, and the, the ones lower down in the periodic table. Our star would produce maybe a number of different elements when it dies, and those elements then would be recycled back in to create new stars or new planets. Is that okay? So just a comparison size here now. There, this is one of the, the largest stars that we know at the moment. It's in the universe. So this is Canaeus Majors. And as a comparison down here, our sun is somewhere in this vast abyss right beside it. So you saw how big our sun really is compared to us, but it's nothing compared to some of the suns and some of the stars that are out there. Okay? But don't worry, that one is much, much further away from us, so it doesn't pose any threat. Okay? Is there any questions there now? No questions? Pardon? A dark star. Um, I suppose a dark star. What you, what you could have is maybe a brown star. Okay, so this is a star that's quite cold. Um, it doesn't uh, produce as much light as as, uh, as different stars. So what you can see is, as you come down through it here, you notice that the kind of the, the color is changing with the uh, with the type of star that you have. The blue stars, the white stars, burn the brightest and the hottest. So they're very very hot stars. As you come down then to the, the red giants and the, the red end, they get a little bit um, it was a bit, a bit colder, right? Um, so, yeah, I suppose a, a dark star would possibly be one of these, these brown dwarfs or, or, or a brown star, which it would have uh, died off or lose most of its energy, so it's not producing all the, all the light anymore. Well. David Bowie. Pardon? <laughs> David Bowie, right, okay. <laughs> yeah. Does the sun change dramatically in size if it's always burning off gases and sending out flares? Our, our sun, at the moment, it's pretty stable. You know, it's, it's not changing that much, but um, it, will, it will change and it will get uh, quite large. So at the moment what you have is this, um, it's a tug of war between gravity and nuclear fusion in, in the core. So the nuclear fusion is pushing out, gravity is pulling it in. A similar analogy would be a, a balloon, blowing up a balloon. You have the gas pressure pushing out and the, the elastic constant of the balloon pushing in. Uh, but over time maybe that elastic constant of the, of the balloon will weaken. So, um, I suppose it wouldn't be a direct comparison, but a similar idea, and the balloon might uh, expand a little bit more. Yeah, but at the moment our star is, is pretty stable. Now it does fluctuate a little bit, but um, nothing really, nothing too much. Yeah. Um, so if it did get bigger, it would lose its bit, uh, turn into lower. Yeah. Um, could it eat up there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it'll eat up most of the planets in the solar system. So it'll get very, very big. But that's in about 4 billion years. Um, so we're, we're, pr we're pretty safe for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else there? No? Okay, so I think we'll um, finish the, the lecture season, the, the series there. I think outside now, and make sure to check if Peter's still outside, but he's put a new filter onto the, uh, the end of the telescope. Uh, a new calcium filter. So you should be able to see, uh, hopefully if you're still outside there, you should be able to see some of the structures a little bit more clear um, than you might have earlier on. But again, we want to be a little bit safe when, when looking at the sun and looking at it. Okay? Any, any questions for Ali? On? Put, put Ali on the spot. <laughs> no. Okay, thank you all very much. I hope you enjoyed uh, the lecture and the, and, and the